Well, good morning and welcome to today's first session for the Solid Wood Bioheat webinar series. So glad that you can be with us today. And I see that we've got people uh, still coming in and joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to a great hour and I'm going to throw things over to our host for today. Jonathan, good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks. Uh, and I'm going to be the host for today's session. Um, so as you likely know, the session that we're launching here today is aimed at uh, increasing awareness about some of the benefits and considerations of using solid woody biofuels for heating uh, here in Ontario. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to mention uh, as well that today's session is being broadcast to you live. Uh, and so we're bringing together bioheat experts from kind of right across uh, home offices right across Canada. Um, of course, we're very grateful that we've got this technology that can bring us all together while we're staying home. Uh, but sometimes technical glitches or time lags can negatively impact your webinar experience. Um, so in the event that we do come across any technical difficulties this morning, please have some patience. Uh, we'll be working to sort out any issues very promptly. Um, as well, uh, happy to say that if you happen to miss part of today's session or if you're interested in sharing it with a friend, you found it uh, really enjoyable, we're going to be offering a session of today, a recording of today's session, uh, and that will be hosted on the CRIB website. So stay tuned uh, for notice that that will be posted up. Great. Uh, so this solid wood uh, bioheat webinar series is being launched today as a result of partnership between uh, Ontario's Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, FP Innovations, Natural Resources Canada, and the Centre for Research and Innovation in the Bioeconomy, or as we like to call them, CRIB. Uh, that's who's going to be hosting uh, our, our recordings a bit later on. So once again, just say thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you've got planned uh, with, I uh, hope you enjoy what we have planned for you today. Uh, so to start things off, uh, we're going to hear from Sean McGuire. Uh, he's the Assistant Deputy Minister for uh, the Forest Industry Division in Ontario's Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. He's going to share some opening remarks uh, and kind of set the stage for our six week series uh, as we move forward. After that, we're going to dive right into the topic uh, that brings us here today, uh, and that's why choose bioheat. Uh, so Glenn Prevo will be joining us from his home office in North Bay. Uh, where he works as a researcher with FP Innovations, focusing on topics related to the forest bioeconomy and wood manufacturing. He'll be starting off our conversation today and cover some of the main benefits and concepts behind bioheat, just so that you are ready for uh, our subsequent sessions. Heather Reed is the second speaker that we've got lined up for today's session. Uh, Heather's going to follow up after Glenn to share some of her own personal experiences with modern bioheat equipment uh, at Abbey Gardens, which is a food hub uh, located in Ontario's Halliburton Highlands. Uh, so thanks so much for our speakers for joining today. Uh, we're going to be holding a question and answer session period at the end uh, where we hope to share your audience questions with our speakers. And so on that note, we've got some information about how you can tune in uh, on the slide here. So for the question and answer session, we're going to be hosting um, using Slido to share audience questions. If you've never used Slido before, that shouldn't be a problem. The system is very easy to use uh, and can be accessed from your internet browser. You can visit uh, Slido by accessing uh, the link displayed on the screen, which is just uh, www.sli dot do or simply slido.com um, once you've made it uh, onto the page you can enter the participant code bioheat f4 uh, that's for today's date february 4th uh, as well a message should have gone out to your email that you registered with uh, earlier this morning which includes some of the links uh, and the same participant code information you can access here um, so if you have questions to share please send them over Slido. Um, other participants in that uh, forum will be able to either upvote uh, some of your questions that they want uh, posed to the webinar speakers. In the event that we don't get through all of the questions today, uh, we'll be following up with you after the session just to make sure that we can continue the conversation. Really looking forward to
So we know today, just based on the registration, that people are joining us from right across Ontario and Canada as well. So the poll question that we'd like to ask to you is, where are you joining us from today? Uh, and I'll just give everybody a moment to submit their response over Slido. Be very interested to see where everybody uh, is joining us from. Okay, so I think uh, probably a good idea to move things along. We've got a pretty uh, tight agenda today, so um, we're ready to get started with, with our, our webinar session. So it's my uh, honor to welcome Sean McGuire. Uh, he serves as the Assistant Deputy Minister for Forest Industry Division at the MNRF, as I had mentioned a little earlier. Uh, and he's going to start off the session today by delivering some opening remarks uh, to start off the webinar series. So Sean, uh, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Pass the mic over to you. Thank you. So good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to the first session of the Solid Bio, Solid Wood Bioheat webinar series. Um, and thanks to Jonathan for uh, getting this, this session started and to all of you out in the audience for joining today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Sean McGuire. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister for Forest Industry Division of uh, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, and it's my pleasure to join today and sit in on some of the important work that promotes sustainable uses for Ontario's forest resources. And uh, and just so you know, I'm, I'm more than a guy who just talks the biomass talk. Today I'm coming to you from my family camp on Batchwana Bay, uh, which is entirely dependent on biomass heat. And I'm not asking for your sympathy, even though I've been exiled to camp for the lockdown. I, I, I continue to soldier on. Um, and uh, I didn't put my uh, I didn't put my location on Slido because I didn't want to mess with my technology, but uh, uh, I'm I'm disclosing it's Batchewana Bay. Um, so for for my for my division at uh, MNRF, it, it provides leadership on forest industry uh, support, re revitalization and transformation initiatives and advocates for the business and economic functions of the forest sector. As part of this role, um, forest industry division recently let led the uh, development of sustainable growth Ontario's forest sector strategy which was released by the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry John John Yakabuski in, in August 2020. Drawing on stakeholder and feedback and ideas this long-term strategic document sets a course to create jobs and encourage growth in the forest industry while supporting the indigenous northern and rural communities that depend on it and building, building from our strong system of sustainable forest management, the strategy sets out actions that aim to unlock potential of the forest sector by encouraging the use of underutilized wood, low quality fiber and mill byproducts. Ontario has established a target of harvesting our entire available supply, wood supply uh, by 2030 in a manner that continues to protect habitat and the environmental and, and the environment while, while growing the economy and creating forest sector jobs. The webinar series we're launching today is one, one way that we're working to build awareness about the innovative uses for wood. As I'm sure we'll hear today, modern bioheat equipment and biofuels from sustainably managed forests can be an energy solution for numerous applications. Individual homes and residences, large structures like office buildings, and even entire communities can be heated with a range of equipment and fuel types that have become vital a vital clean technology for forested regions across the Northern Hemisphere. As part of sustainable growth, Ontario committed to developing and implementing a forest biomass action plan that will support economic development while building an awareness of the role that biomass can play in meeting the ambitious goals in the forest sector strategy. And to that end, uh, Forest Industry Division has been working closely with its forest sector stakeholders and partners. Using Ontario's forest resources and mill byproducts to generate bioheat is one example of how the province can help to build the forest industry while supporting environmental objectives experiences in other jurisdictions and some important Ontario successes have success stories have shown that increasing the use of bioheat can result in supply chain efficiencies, promote community development and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Like you, I'm eager to hear from the speakers we have lined up on for this webinar series. I hope you'll join me in learning from them and we can work together towards establishing a vibrant bioheat sector that continues to a sustainable and prosperous forest industry. Uh, we're grateful for the partnership and expertise offered by our webinar, webinar partners in putting this putting on this series uh, by working collaboratively with organizations like FP Innovations, our federal partners at Natural Resources Canada, 
uh, and innovators like Cribe, we're optimistic that Ontario's forest sector can become a leader in providing bio-based solutions for many industries and consumers. So once again, thank you for tuning in to today's webinar session. And my thanks to the session organizers for the opportunity to share a few comments on behalf of MNRF. And at, now, at this point, I'll pass the mic over to Glenn Prevo. Uh, he's a researcher with FB Innovations who will kick off today's main discussion, why choose BioHeat? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Prevo. Uh, I work for FP Innovations, uh, and uh, I'm going to be kicking off the technical presentations of this series uh, and providing you with a quick overview or a high level overview of bioheat wood, wood solid wood bioheat systems uh, in Ontario. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I live in North Bay and I work for FP Innovations. I've for FP Innovations for the past three years um, and my role is providing technical assistance to the forestry and wood products businesses in Ontario um, and I was hired uh, originally uh, to write a solid wood bioheat guide for rural and remote communities in Ontario um, because of my background as an engineer and, and a forester. For those who are not familiar with FP Innovations, we are a private not-for-profit organization that specializes in the creation of solutions uh, for the forest products uh, and wood products industries. And that ranges everything from forest uh, operations and forest inventories through to pulp and paper, bioproducts uh, and wood products uh, and everything in between. Today, I'm, I am going to introduce you to some basic terms around bioheat, the different types of biofuels that are covered through this webinar series, and more specifically, the guide that I wrote, um, the different types of bioheat combustion systems that uh, would be applicable, and the benefits of bioheat. Uh, for those of you who would like a copy of the bioheat guide that this webinar series is based around, uh, an electronic copy can be found, found at the link below, uh, and hard copies are available uh, through, by contacting me directly. Biomass uh, is any material of biological origin and it can come from aquaculture or agriculture, horticulture. In this case, we're talking about forest biomass. So that's stems and sticks and twigs uh, that generally come from trees. Um, and then when you take that biomass and process it and turn it into something that you burn for heat, uh, that it is then called a biofuel uh, and we're talking about solid wood biofuel so we're not talking about any liquid uh, biofuels uh, in this in this webinar series or in the guide and as i mentioned when you burn that biofuel it produces bioheat um, in terms of the guides, the scope of the guide, we're looking at uh, hot water and space heating for institutional, commercial buildings, private homes, uh, generally targeted for rural and remote communities in Ontario, uh, although uh, the information in the guide uh, might be of interest to many different uh, other audiences. Uh, it looks at systems that are less than one megawatt uh, and the majority of institutional and commercial buildings and certainly private homes would uh, fall well below that, uh, that threshold. I think it's important to note, uh, as was mentioned by Sean, that uh, bioheat is uh, you know, a mature technology used many other places and, and Ontario could, uh, could take advantage of this technology, learning from what's uh, already been implemented in other places in Canada. Glenn, if I could just Alaska. stop you for one sec. Um, yeah. I know that you're. I know that you have a presentation file that you're following along. It's not showing up on the screen currently. I was just wondering if I could trouble you oh. to share that uh, as we continue on. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought uh, I thought that uh, that you shared that. Sorry. Uh, I, I apologize. If you if you didn't mind uh, sharing that, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Here it comes. Perfect. There we go. Now it's all good. OK, OK, so um, didn't 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 uh, miss too much. I still the bulk of the presentation left. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about different types of biofuels. Uh, first, um, we're going to be talking about cordwood, wood chips, 
wood briquettes and wood pellets. Um, and this, uh, these biofuels will be the subject of a webinar in the future. Um, so more information will be provided at that time, such as the different standards and key properties that, that you need to keep in mind when you're, when you're working with these type of biofuels. So cordwood is a, is a traditional fuel. It's the first one I'll talk about. Probably the most uh, well known. Generally comes from unmerchantable timber, such as the tops of trees or stems that are unsuitable for uh, uh, for saw logs. It's cut, split, and dried and stored under cover, as is seen in the uh, the image on the right. Um, and it can be harvested and processed end user but can also also be bought from uh, from a processor uh, it has high labor costs um, and no automation um, but uh, is perhaps the the easiest and, and simplest of all the biofuels uh, to to use uh, the second type of biofuel <clears throat> are wood chips uh, they generally come from sawmill uh, or harvest byproducts or low quality timber uh, similar to cordwood. Um, they're small uh, little rectangles that are thin. They're produced in a chipper as can be seen uh, in the top right. That's a chipping and screening operation for producing wood chips. Uh, then they're stored and dried in a facility like this until they're ready, ready to be burned. Um, some aspects of the operation can be automated. For example, in the top right, um, there's a wood, uh, an auger that feeds wood chips directly to the boiler. Um, so this this portion of the drying would be done with a loader to move the chips around and load it into a, a storage bin that would feed the combustor. And I'll talk about the combustors in a minute. Um, and it's automatically fed with an auger system. So nobody's shoveling wood chips into into boilers or, or anything like that. Um, and uh, key storage handling is very important for wood chips. The third type are wood briquettes. Uh, they're made of compressed sawdust and small wood shavings that have been dried, uh, usually from sawmill residue. Um, when they're compressed under pressure, it creates heat and the chemicals, the natural chemicals in the wood, the lignin bind them together, so no binders are needed. Um, they range in size, uh, as you can see there on the right, from a hockey puck up to log sized uh, uh, units. Um, and some automation is, is available. Uh, for, for wood briquettes. The final type of biofuel are, are wood pellets. Um, they're the most refined uh, type of biofuel that's covered in the guide and in this uh, webinar series. They're made of compressed sawdust uh, from uh, ground up shavings, wood chips and sawdust, usually from uh, sawmill byproducts. Um, again, no binders are needed. The, the high pressure of compression um, creates heat and binds them together. Uh, the, the good thing about wood pellets is that they have the opportunity to be uh, automated. All the handling can be automated depending on the system that you have. So for example, in, on, in this picture uh, in the center, there's a wood pellet truck that is loading a wood pellet silo. Um, the truck drives up, connects a vacuum tube to the silo uh, and loads the silo up with wood pellets. Wood pellets are then automatically fed to the combustor, which is in a building behind the truck. Um, this service is not available everywhere uh, in the province, but it is available in some places. Um, where it's not available, wood, wood pellets uh, are generally transported on skids in 18 kilogram bags. So the 18 kilogram bags down here in the court or down here in the bottom right uh, are wrapped up uh, multiple bags on one skid. The next, uh, the next uh, uh, type of uh, technology I want to talk about are the, the combustion systems. So those are the stoves, furnaces and boilers that burn these different types of biofuels. Again, there will be a specific webinar that goes into a lot more detail on these different systems and we'll, we'll talk about the more technical aspects uh, of them. Wood stoves are probably the most uh, common and familiar type of combustion system. Um, they are generally, they're, they're designed to heat homes or, or other small spaces. Um, they are not meant to be a primary heating system. Many people do use them to, pro to provide the majority of their heat, but they do require a, a, another system as a backup, um, electric heat or forced air heat from some other source. They'll be designed to burn cordwood or pellets, but not both. Um, and modern wood stoves come with good combustion control. They have to meet good uh, emissions limits to protect uh, air quality. Uh, 
Um, the example shown here is a, a wood pellet stove that's uh, operating. Wood pellets are loaded into the back into what's called a hopper, and those wood pellets are automatically fed into the into the combustion chamber. Uh, wood pellet stoves can be controlled by a wall thermostat or an internal thermostat. Um, uh, and that that covers uh, the, the stove technology. The, the one drawback of pellet stoves versus uh, cordwood stoves is although they're more efficient, uh, they do require electricity to operate. Uh, the, the next type of combustion system are wood furnaces. These are centralized heating systems, very similar to a propane, natural gas, or um, electric or fuel oil furnace. Um, they're thermostatically controlled, as is seen up here in the right-hand corner, and a fan blows air through a ducting system over the heat exchanger in the furnace to the rest of the home. Uh, the unit on the left is a cordwood furnace. Looks a lot like a normal furnace or a traditional fossil fuel furnace, but has a, a wood stove uh, in the center. The user puts wood into the furnace uh, mul uh, several times a day as needed. Um, and this has an electric backup system in case the, the, the owners go away for a period of time and can't load the, uh, load the furnace. The unit on the right is a wood pellet furnace. Um, this shows a, a small storage bin that allows for multiple days or weeks of use, um, so the users do not have to continually fill it up. Those pellets are automatically fed through a vacuum system into the, uh, into the furnace. Uh, and then the heat is distributed to the rest of the home. Again, they're designed to, to burn cordwood or pellets, but not both. The final type of combustion system are wood boilers, and they can heat uh, homes right up to very large buildings. Uh, and they'll be designed to burn either cordwood or pellets or wood chips, not all three. Although there are some larger boilers that can be converted to burn wood chips or pellets, just not at the same time. Uh, going through the different systems here on the on the slide, this system on the left that is a wood pellet boiler that uh, that is uh, heating a small school outside of North Bay. Uh, it's been installed in a shipping container uh, with a storage silo for the wood chips outside. Um, storage container uh, systems are are common for energy systems and other industrial systems. It's a it's a convenient way to set them up. <clears throat> The unit in the middle is a cordwood boiler used to heat a home uh, and cordwood boilers generally need a buffer tank, a hot water storage tank, in order for them to operate efficiently. Uh, and this will be the topic of discussion in, in further webinars about how to operate these systems uh, efficiently. The unit on the top right is a wood chip boiler, uh, combined uh, capacity of one megawatt, and they heat uh, 400,000 square feet of institutional space. Uh, the wood boilers generally have the most sophisticated controls and very good combustion uh, emissions control. And will come, the higher end models will come with control systems such as uh, the one shown on the right that can be used to control not only the boiler, but other energy systems such as hot water or solar thermal systems. So that's an overview of the different types of bioheat uh, combustion systems and biofuels. And so I think it's important now to talk about why would you want to implement these systems. Um, as this table shows here, um, generally speaking, biofuels are cheaper than uh, other types of heating uh, fuels with the exception of natural gas. Um, but because bioheat is produced locally, um, it allows for a shorter, a shorter supply chain, one that's not reliant on global supply chains, increasing energy security and stabilizing costs. When users are, are trained to operate the systems, they are easy, to, easy and reliable to operate. The next, uh, next benefit of bioheat is because biofuels are produced from local forests, it means that local jobs are created and maintained. Uh, that includes forest management jobs, uh, tasks that need to be completed in the forest for sustainable forest management. Uh, that includes transportation systems to move uh, wood from the forest to a processing facility. And then when it's processed into a biofuel to the end user, 
uh, and it includes uh, processing facilities like this in the center. This is in contrast to, to other types of, of heating systems like fossil fuels, which rely on processing that's generally done outside of the community, as well as a lot of administration that's done outside of the community. So keeps jobs local and helps maintain existing jobs in the forest uh, industry. Uh, as, as was mentioned by Sean, Ontario has a very good and robust uh, sustainable forest management system. And, and so because we, we ensure the sustainability of our forests by law, it allows uh, us to ensure that bioheat or biofuels produced from uh, Ontario's forests are renewable and sustainable. Additionally, um, they provide the opportunity for funding for local forest stewardship activities, such as uh, thinning activities like you see on the right, uh, or uh, reducing fire loads near communities. Uh, oftentimes, uh, material from thinnings or, or, or fire reducing, reducing fire loads don't have a market, but if you have a local bioheat system that can purchase that, that wood for its fuel, that helps offset costs. Additionally, Ontario has seen the closure of many pulp and paper uh, mills, uh, and those mills would have taken lower quality uh, wood from from harvest. And now we need other 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 places and other uses for that lower quality uh, fiber, and bioheat is one of those options. Finally. Uh, the, the final benefits I want to talk about are the fact that bioheat is a low carbon fuel. So because we manage our forests sustainably in Ontario and, and they have high productivity, we continue to sequester carbon in our forests. The trees suck up the carbon. Um, during combustion, combar carbon is released into the atmosphere, but then the forests uh, uh, take that back in as they grow. Uh, another important point is that the, the spill and environmental risk from uh, from biofuels is very low. Um, you're just, I mean, it's not really essentially non-existent because if you spill uh, wood chips or wood pellets, um, it's just wood. Uh, whereas, you know, many communities have struggled with spills of fuel oil or diesel, um, many individuals as well, uh, and that can cause soil contamination and other health and environmental risks uh, that biofuels simply don't pose. And the final point is that Modern bioheat systems have emissions that are on par with fossil fuel uh, systems. They have low emissions that are regulated uh, federally in some cases and provincially in other cases um, to ensure that uh, that we protect our air uh, and and health around health of people around uh, these systems. So they're not uh, they're not dirty polluting systems at all. Uh, they're highly engineered modern mechanical heating systems. So that that concludes the the overview uh, of solid of solid wood bioheat systems in Ontario. I just want to reiterate that they're modern and efficient heating systems uh, and can provide many benefits that other systems simply can't provide. Um, bioheat uh, is local, it's sustainable, it's renewable, uh, and there are many resources within Ontario for people who want to start a bioheat project. That includes the bioheat guide um, that, that I authored and was supported by Natural Resources Canada uh, and, the, and the government uh, of Ontario. It includes this bioheat webinar series and all the different people who will be talking in this uh, and, and resources within government. So thank you very much for that, for, for listening to this first presentation. Um, there are many people who helped put the guide together uh, as well as this presentation. And I just want to acknowledge some of those uh, some of those people. And finally, say that anybody who'd uh, like to talk more with me, I, I welcome you to get in touch with me. Uh, my contact information uh, is there. So thank you very much. Um, uh, and I'm not sure, Jonathan, if I'm passing to you or passing directly over to Heather. Yeah, back to me just for a brief second. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Glenn, for giving us the introduction to the session. Uh, I think you gave us a great overview uh, of BioHeat, why people should consider it uh, here in Ontario. Uh, and so with that, I suppose best to pass the mic over to Heather. Uh, as I mentioned, Heather is joining us from Abbey Gardens today uh, and she'll be, um, she will be uh, giving a bit of an overview about her own experiences with uh, solid wood bioheat. Uh, and with that, uh, take it away, Heather. Looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Just get in uh, presentation view. So please let me know if that's uh, 
not coming up. Um, okay, great. Uh, so my name is Heather Reed, and I'm the operations director of a project called Abbey Gardens. We are located in the Halliburton Highlands, and the image you see here is of a uh, uh, used up gravel pit. So our big dream is to create a community resource from a space uh, in in our community that we traditionally think of as as used up and uh, not a resource for uh, for people in our community. And what we're trying to do is develop this space um, as a as a demonstration and education center for sustainable, more sustainable ways of living. So we have on the property. This is actually originally when it was purchased in 2009, so there's not a whole lot going on other than extraction at this point. Uh, but currently we have um, a very strong local food theme. Uh, we have recreational trails and educational programs for uh, the whole spectrum of the population here, and then a variety of different um, uh, demonstrations and educational self-guided things that people can come and do. So what I thought I would do today is is talk a, just a little bit about our history to give some context and then uh, shift gears into um, why we chose to uh, incorporate a biomass boiler into our development and, and the benefits that I see probably from a very non-technical perspective. Um, but Hopefully that's uh, that will add to the conversation just from a from an operational point of view. Heather, just before we continue on, I noticed that there's a small square down in the one corner of your presentation. I bet you it looks like the webcast. I was just wondering if I could have you minimize that so that everything shows up and then feel free if you want to. You can also share your camera if that is uh, uh, something that you would like to do. Um, I'm not finding my camera, Rob. Never mind that. Don't you worry. Think about it. You continue on with your presentation. OK, <laughs> the slides are much better to look at anyway. Um, so just a brief, brief history of uh, Abbey Gardens development. We uh, incorporated as a not for profit charity in 2009 and acquired the property uh, that we currently have in 2010. And again, at that time, it was really a vision to take um, to take a spent gravel pit and transform it into a community place of, of learning and resource. Since 2010, we have added to the overall acreage and we, we now have 380 acres. Um, about half of that is the, the, uh, the pit area. In 2013, we made a big shift from uh, the CSA gar community supported agriculture garden approach that you see in the picture at the bottom. And we partnered with Fleming College to build um, a food hub. And that has evolved into a retail space and a commercial kitchen that supports local growers uh, as well as local value added food businesses. Uh, we share our kitchen with a couple of other entrepreneurs and um, have developed that into a, a year round business and resource for our, our local food community. Um, in 2016, we took the big leap to do a fairly large development project. Uh, we had been approached by a small microbrewery and a solar and wind business who were at the solar and wind business was an established um, established business and the brewery was a new business uh, to locate on our property and we so we added the element of supporting economic development and other businesses that were like-minded in terms of wanting to operate in a sustainable manner um, and also be providing services in, in the case of Halliburton Solar and Wind that that meshed with our with our vision. So that was uh, a, a, a big focal point and that's when we also got into um, 
engaged with uh, Biothermic and decided to incorporate a biomass boiler into that project. And I'll, I'll come back to that. In 2018, uh, we also renovated uh, a home on the property and that was renovated into the Abbey Retreat Centre, which, uh, which offers four day cancer care retreats for patients and their caregivers who are who are at some stage of their cancer journey, really focusing on personal health and wellness and how to get through that process. That also was the year that the final portion of the active gravel pits closed. So that was a big chapter for us as well. Um, so just coming up to current, uh, we've been adjusting as everyone with uh, with COVID and really the last year has um, in terms of site development has been a focus on trail development. What can people come and do here on their own um, and looking to the future to do some research on experimental greenhouses and actually coming back to biomass as an option to incorporate into that type of future project. So that's a really quick overview uh, of where we've come from. Um, and I'll just uh, shift gears into the our decision to choose a biomass boiler. And there were a, a, a few variables here, as you can imagine, as a not-for-profit starting out, um, development projects are, are a bit scary. Um, it was a big capital investment for us. But through that process, we met um, uh, Vince and Mike from Biothermic and got really inspired about the vision for local fuel uh, and that really hit home with what what we're trying to do around promoting sustainable development um, and listening to them talk about how we could support and be a demonstration for bringing the fuel decisions closer to home for Ontarians um, was a really big factor in our decision. Um, we also want to be supporting local business uh, and that so that was a bit of a no brainer with uh, with biothermic at that time. And it's exciting to be able to have a demonstration of some some new technology that people can actually come and see what it looks like. Um, and get a get a walkthrough with people who know how the system works, see the buildings it's heating. Um, and we've had several e examples of uh, visits from politicians and other interested parties um, to our site to look at that demonstration. So it's one thing to see, to, to understand how the systems worked, but, it, but to be able to really see one working was another factor for our for our incorporation into our project. Um, and then of course there's it's it's very efficient. Uh, the the low operating costs um, of the system and the fuel is great for us as well as for our tenants using those buildings and the ease of maintenance um, in that kind of system. So there's very little waste with the system. The emissions are um, very low there's not a lot to do. It's very automated. So as a operations person on a fairly large property, that's a wonderful benefit to the system that we that we have on the on the site. Um, just to bring it to life a little bit, uh, the top uh, left is our little boiler building. So originally we had put the boiler inside uh, the brewery, but decided to move it out into its own space. So again, this facilitates um, the demonstration part of incorporating the boiler into the property so people can come and take a look uh, on their own, even peek in through the windows or it's a separate building for people to visit. And within that, excuse me, small building, there's also space for us to expand if we were to want to heat additional space. Um, and then in the bottom right, I think Glenn uh, used a different angle of the same picture, um, but that we do have the wood pellet silo adjacent to the building, um, which gets uh, filled up once a year. 
Uh, and the equipment that we have, um, the, these are the images of inside the building. So the boiler is on the left hand side um, with a, a smaller cache of pellets as well. And um, you know, it's it's amazing over the last four, almost five years. I don't have to I don't have to spend much time with this unit at all. So one of the things that I really like about it um, is that it talks to it talks to biothermic directly um, or talks to a maintenance person directly and sends um, via computer. It sends maintenance issues when things are going wrong, when it needs to be emptied. Um, so that's all very automated, which again, from an operations point of view, is a real gift. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the um, the uh, water, hot water tank and a little bit to the right of that, there are two meters. So we chose to meter the buildings separately because we're heating two different buildings. And so we can monitor the usage and we've established a rate. So we um, have a, a payback from our tenants as well. So it was nice to be able to meter the system as well. If you have multiple buildings and you want to get a sense of the heat requirements for each one of them. Um, these are the two buildings that we're heating. Um, so again, on the left is the brewery building and it is a total of 4,200 square feet. And it includes a production space of about 3,000 square feet and that is a four stair system. And then they have a front house and offices um, which are in floor heating. Um, with the hot water system. And on the right is the Halliburton Solar and Wind Building. This, um, as an aside, was also built in partnership with the uh, Fleming, with Fleming College with their sustainable building program. So it is a combination of rammed earth, which you can see on the front, and straw bale walls. So there's also a, a really high um, insulation value for that building in particular, um, but it does have the in-floor heating and um, has a supplemental propane wall heater um, more for the that in-between season. So early, very early um, in the fall when you just sort of need to take the edge off, but the boiler's not running yet. There is a supplemental heat for that second building and it's about 1800 square feet. Um, my understanding is that our our single boiler uh, has capacity to uh, to heat more than just those two buildings, and then we have space in that small boiler building to add another furnace as well. So uh, we were trying to think ahead when we were implementing this particular project, and I think from an efficiency point of view, uh, for a, for a property like ours that will pay off in the in the long term. So just overall the benefits that I see um, from the operations perspective are definitely the maintenance um, aspect. Um, so we're not in needing to troubleshoot. We're not needing to be um, doing a whole lot of maintenance to the system on an ongoing basis, which is a real gift. Um, we get uh, pellets delivered uh, and that's done on a cyclical basis <clears throat> and there's it's a very it's an extremely low operating cost so our pellet delivery would be between four and five thousand dollars a year um, which to heat those two buildings is, is very affordable for us so even though the capital costs initially um, could be a, a bit higher than a traditional propane system, although I imagine that's changed in the last five years. Um, the operating costs are very manageable for an organization like ours. 
I also do want to highlight the support that we've had from uh, Biothermic and dealing with a local company who is really passionate about what they're doing. And I, again, I think the benefits of supporting the local economy and those local jobs and um, a very strong industry in our province is another benefit that we see not only from a philosophical point of view as an organization, uh, but also in the type of service and the response that we get from um, from biothermic in this case. Um, but just having that local connection is really a huge benefit for us. Probably a bit unique to Abbey Gardens. Um, the benefits of having the demonstrate, adding that as a demonstration to the property and being able to talk about local fuel and options for people as part of our overall property tours is also a huge benefit to us. And in terms of the support that we uh, were able to get from investors in the project, that again was another benefit that we were able to talk about with them um, to help support the construction of that phase of our development. So there's the practical side of the benefits, but I think also in our case, um, adding, adding a very tangible way to show people how they can look at more sustainable fuel options and highlight that local fuel story is a really important part of what we're trying to do overall as an organization. So that's been a, a huge benefit for us as well. Um, and just in conclusion, I think uh, the participating in the creation of the manual and learning more about um, bioheat myself uh, and also looking around our community, which I don't imagine is uh, that unique in terms of northern communities in Ontario. Um, many, many, many people here are heating with wood already. And so to be able to tell that story and make it more user friendly and expand the access to um, more automated systems for bioheat is a really exciting thing to think about in terms of the future and sustainability of our province um, and to get to the point where um, you know we have trucks delivering wood pellets just as trucks are delivering uh, propane to households is a, again is a really exciting part of the vision for sustainable local fuel that we're really excited to be part of. So um, yeah, and I just I thought that I would leave some time for questions. And so I guess I'm passing it back to Jonathan. Yeah, to yeah. me. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, thank you so much, Heather. That was a great overview. I really enjoyed learning a bit about Abbey Gardens. I've read a little bit about the system that you guys had installed, but had never kind of got the overview on, um, you know, the the uh, setup you've got. So that was fantastic to hear about. Uh, and again, thanks, I guess, uh, on behalf of our ministry anyway, and helping people learn about some of those new highly efficient technologies. Uh, as you mentioned, lots of people are kind of familiar with heating with wood, uh, maybe people a little less familiar with some of those newer uh, high efficiency technologies. So uh, thanks again for that. Uh, and as well for giving us a great uh, segue into our question and answer period um, for this session today. We've got about 10 minutes left uh, in our uh, scheduled webinar. So if possible, I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Rob to pull up um, Slido information just so that everybody can tune into that once again. Uh, you should be able to access um, through a QR code or using the uh, BioHeat F4 um, code that we had given you before. Perfect. Oh, and it's displaying the questions for me and everything. That's fantastic. <laughs> Great. at that point in time, if that would work out, just to have all three of you up on screen at the same time. 
Yeah, I think that's an excellent setup. Thanks uh, for joining me, guys. I'm not so uh, lonely with the webcam here anymore. Appreciate that. Um, so it looks like our very first question that popped in here um, is a is a more popular one. We've got some upvotes on it, uh, and I think it's a pretty easy question to answer. So it seems directed at Glenn, uh, and the question is, can you link to the guide Glenn mentioned um, via email since we missed that slide? So apologies for the technical difficulties uh, at the beginning there, but Glenn, I'll let you uh, take that one. Uh, yeah, yeah, cert certainly. Uh, uh, Jonathan, I think you have you have the distribution list for the people who uh, joined. So maybe would that be the best way to to send that out? Um, um, I, unless there's a way that I can send it right now, I, I'd be happy to do that as well. Um, like just through the through the chat or through Slido. Um, well, so I think uh, if if possible it probably would just make sense to get all of those presentations uploaded onto Cribe or something like that um, okay of course people are very welcome to like reach out to me by email uh, i think everybody should have it i will present it uh, just at the end of this session so i'm happy to kind of be the go between and get some of those resources to folks as well too so happy to help okay yeah yeah and then, and i think that was the second question there about the presentation yeah that, that can be posted and it has the link embedded in it too Mm. Uh, and so as well, we are going to be posting uh, recordings of each of the sessions too. So you'll be able to see the presentations both kind of in the PDF copy or hard copy as well as in the recording. Um, I'm not entirely sure exactly how long it will take for the recordings to get posted, um, but we'll make sure to send out a notice so that you guys can come back and, and relive uh, this webinar a bit later on. Um, so it looks like our next question that we've got here is one for Heather, uh, flipping back. And so it says here, you know, kudos for taking a step towards sustainable heating uh, at Abbey Gardens. Uh, and the person is asking what kinds of people or groups have been interested in your biothermic system? You kind of mentioned that a few people were uh, interested in learning about it. So who? Cool. Um, yeah, we and again, I, I may defer a little bit to uh, Vince Rudder as I know he's part of a, another webinar and would have the the uh, nitty gritty details. Um, but we have done tours with um, our municipal leaders here and who are looking at um, actually a bioheat system for the town of Halliburton um, and a number of uh, parties involved with that effort, which is, which was kind of pretty interesting. Um, our local development corporation uh, also came for a tour. So that's our local uh, Canadian Futures Development Corporation um, to get an idea of how it worked so that they can advise other, other local businesses starting up. Um, and then we've had a handful of um, of uh, people who are looking at home applications. So residential, large residential home uh, applications coming as well. We are in cottage country here. And so some of that, some of that development, uh, those developments are, are fairly large and would um, be of interest in terms of a wood pellet system. Cool, so kind of a, a different range of both institutional mm -hmm. and kind of residential uh, folks who are interested in that system. So again, uh, yeah. thanks for spreading the word there. Uh, mm -hmm. And as well, again, thanks for the plug for our session next week uh, with them <laughs> to answer that question uh, a bit more too. Um, great, uh, I'm not sure who this next question is directed to. I'm wondering if Glenn, you might be willing to uh, take, take it up. Uh, the question that we have here is, are you aware of the cost savings between heating buildings with wood pellets instead of using petroleum based heating? Um, so not too sure exactly if that's directed at Heather for her specific buildings or just to Glenn in the most general sense. So I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer in a general sense and then Heather, if you have, if you have other information. So if you want to get a, a sense of what the cost savings are of the different systems uh, or the different biofuels in the bioheat guide, I have a table that talks about um, the dollar per gigajoule. So it's a, an apples to apples comparison for all the common heating fuels and the biofuels. Uh, and you'll see that the biofuels uh, are cheaper than all the other fuels except for natural gas. Um, so if, if that's what you're what you're talking about in general in a general sense, um, that can be found in the guide. Um, if you're doing project planning, I would encourage you to contact some local suppliers to understand uh, biofuel costs and and uh, 
electrical or fossil fuel costs in your local area. So I don't know, Heather, if you've done any analysis on your buildings, but I'll, I'll throw that over to you now. Yeah, when we were looking at the, the cost benefits of the capital investment for the bioheat system, um, certainly a similar chart to the one that's in the manual was one that we referenced in terms of making that decision. Um, of course, type of use for every building makes it really hard to, you know, to project um, apples to apples in terms of if we had it heated with propane, what would the difference be? Um, but I, what I will say is we do have other systems on the property. So we have a geothermal with electric for our food hub and um and are actually are looking at moving over from an oil furnace for the abbey retreat center and when you look at the annual costs for much smaller buildings um, of the fuel to heat those to basically the same you know for the same type of use um the cost comparison operationally is i mean those charts are very accurate i would say from our experience and, and and I I would I would also say a company like Biotherma could help with that. Uh, or if you have any questions, uh, you know I'd I'd be happy to talk uh, you know offline with somebody if they had more more detailed needs. Great. Well, thank you guys for uh, tag teaming that one. Hope somebody got a sense there of kind of how how that sorts out. And like Glenn mentioned, uh, follow up with him maybe if you want to have a bit more of a conversation about those uh, fuel cost savings. Um, so I am noticing that we did have two questions pop up that were kind of similar. Um, so I will uh, jump to those and share them both at the same time. It looked like Jeff and Gordon both had the same question uh, for Heather, and that was where do you source your pellets from and who delivers them? Uh, so that's done all through Biothermic. Um, and I, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but I think again, it would be an interesting update in and I'm sure it's in one of the future webinars, but to talk about the potential to build the the wood pellet production in Ontario. Um, I haven't kept current, but I know in 2016 um, we were we still weren't there in terms of the the um, specific types of pellets that were required for our system. Um, but that but that there's that potential for that production to be um closer to home yeah so the short answer is i don't know ask vince and mike um, <laughs> um but uh but they again it's another example of how they just provide service um for for the units that they're putting in Great, uh, thanks so much. Again, plug for our, our webinar that we've got queued up next week. Uh, so I hope Jeff and Gordon, you'll consider joining us and you can ask that very question uh, to one of the folks who's delivering those, those uh, pellets. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the next question I'm seeing here, I'm also noticing we've got about one minute left. Uh, so we might have time for one or two uh, questions, but that's probably about it before we've got to wrap up. Uh, the question here we have is, are any financial incentives offered by the Government of Canada or Province of Ontario for biomass projects? Um, tough question to answer maybe for this panel. I don't know, Glenn, if you came across any while you were going through development of the guidebook, could be great to kind of share any of those uh, resources. Yeah, not, nothing that I'm current on. Um, I'd, I'd have to do some looking and would probably throw that back to some of your colleagues, Jonathan, or, or some of Sebdem's uh, uh, colleagues at, uh, at Natural Resources Canada. Sure. Okay. Um, go ahead. Yeah, now. I will just I will just add when we were doing our our development project, it was a, and this may be ex, this may be specific to not for profits, but um, incorporating. Uh, innovative technology and sustainable technology was certainly something that was very well received and we did receive some federal funding for that project. Um, it would be interesting to look at the Climate Change Action Fund as well, which is focused on um, reducing the impacts of climate change and, that, and there's a really good case to be made for this type of heating system around those types of themes, if that's at all helpful. 
Yeah, well, and I, maybe also worthwhile pointing out that, you know, some of those um, incentives or things like that can help kind of overcome that upfront capital cost, which is a barrier yeah. for so many projects when they're available, right? So probably maybe what our uh, anonymous question asker was pointing at, uh, looking for a little bit of support to get over that hump, uh, so to speak, right at the beginning. Um, okay, so we're at one minute after 12. I'm going to ask one more question uh, here to Glenn that we've got queued up. Uh, and then I think that's probably all the time we've got for today. So uh, the question we've got here for Glenn is, you know, it says congratulations on one year anniversary for the solid wood bioheat guidebook. I think it's almost a year to the day or something like that. So yeah, that, that uh, commenter is right. Congratulations for that. Yeah. Have you had many uh, groups uh, engage with you about starting bioheat projects since that's been published? Uh, yeah, when we published the guide, there was quite a bit of interest from, from many different groups. Uh, and in fact, I had all the guides, 350 guides spoken for um, when they were uh, the physical hard copy guides spoken for. But then COVID hit and that kind of fell through. People uh, weren't able to distribute them the way they wanted to. Um, and I have been in touch with a couple organizations similar to Abbey Gardens who was, was interested. Um, but a lot of the interest that has been coming to me has been more of a, of a general nature looking for the background information um, that was in the guide uh, and actually what will be covered in this webinar series uh, so uh, that's that's my experience with people being interested um, but a lot of interest in in getting the guide and, and getting that information yeah well it's a fantastic resource so again kudos to you for uh, spearheading putting that together and uh, making sure that uh, people get the information they need about these technology types mm. Um, okay, so I, I do see we do have some additional questions here. Unfortunately, I've got to let our speakers go, I think. Uh, you must have some other things lined up for today. So I think we'll be happy to follow up with uh, the questions uh, a little bit after. Um, so a few of them I see were anonymous there. Uh, we can likely just post a copy of the question and then a copy of the response and put that kind of in a, in a publicly available space so that you guys can go and access that a little bit later on. Um, and so I guess really on, on that note, we are ready to wrap things up here. Let me just share my screen once more. Perfect. So we did our question and answer period. All that's left essentially is for me to say thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed hearing a little bit about why a solid wood bioheat can be a good solution here in Ontario. Um, as I've mentioned a few times, I think during the course of the webinar, we'd like to send a friendly reminder that you can register uh, for upcoming webinar sessions. Uh, we've got five more planned uh, and you can learn more about those by visiting uh, cribe.ca uh, slash resources slash bioheat dash webinar dash series. Um, so next week we'll be back to learn about the various different types of biofuels that can be made from wood. Uh, we'll hear a bit about the standards behind uh, their production uh, and as well as some supply chain considerations for each of the different types of fuels. Uh, during that session, we'll be joined by Sebnem Madrali from Natural Resources Canada. Uh, and as Heather so kindly queued up for us, Vince Rudder will be joining from Biothermic as well too. Uh, so he's going to share a little bit of firsthand experience with uh, biofuels research and management. Um, so you can find registration links for that February 11th session by visiting the CRIBE website that I just mentioned. It's also up there on the slide. I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with it, having gone through the registration process for this webinar. Uh, and again, a reminder that those sessions will be held weekly every Thursday uh, until March 11th. And I'm really looking forward to having you join us again. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about the series that you'd like to pass along, maybe something didn't get answered during the question and answer period that you really wanted to hear about right away, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you about that. So you can find my contact information, uh, Jonathan Hallis, um, Jonathan Hallis at Ontario.ca, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to work to get some answers to your questions about the series or, or the content within. So with that, uh, I'll be signing out. I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day and a fantastic rest of your week. Thanks for joining us. You have been attending today's Bio Heat webinar series, the first one in the series. We hope that we'll see you again. This ends our broadcast for the day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe.